Hello, and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and today we have a very special guest in Eva Zubek. Eva is a Polish traveler that migrated to the UK at a young age and attended Oxford University, where she gained her language degrees. But this just sparked her desire to travel, and she became a popular television host and ultimately now has a YouTube channel with 1.5 million subscribers. But at her heart, Eva is an overlander, and she's currently traveling in her Defender 110, the length of the Americas. Our wide-ranging conversation includes ways that she stays healthy, mentally and physically on the road, how she travels solo with her dog, and her aspirations for talking about the healthy benefits of travel around the world. And a special thanks to Nimble Vehicles for supporting this week's podcast. Nimble Vehicles has been the leading manufacturer of extreme expedition vehicles since 2019. The Nimble Evolution is the ultimate vehicle for beginning overlanders and extreme adventurers alike. The proprietary lightweight aluminum flatbed combined with a luxurious habitat allows you to confidently go where others only dream of. Built on any one-ton chassis or larger with an off-roading package, 75 gallons of fresh water, over 1,000 watts of solar, and over 1,000 amp hours of lithium ion batteries, you can expect to be off the grid for extended periods of time. To find out more information, visit nimblevehicles.com online, or you can email info at nimblevehicles.com for more information. Thanks again, Nimble. Eva, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And you're here with your puppy dog, Vilk, as well. That's right. So for those that are listening and watching on YouTube, we have a, a beautiful um, dog that we've got with us. He looks like a German shepherd. Is that right? That's exactly it. Okay. And we'll talk about your puppy here in a little bit. But what I want to start to understand is you went from essentially Poland to London mm -hmm. to Nepal, as I understand. And that was, I would love to understand a little bit about what inspired you to move from Poland to London, and then what made you think about buying a one-way ticket to Nepal? Well, I moved from Poland to the UK um, with my family. So it wasn't exactly my decision. Okay. It was one of those economic decisions for my family where, you know, around that time in Poland, things um, weren't exactly going terribly well. It was a new democracy. And so my mom made the decision to move away in search of better work opportunities. Mm. And so I moved with her. And how, how old were you when that happened? I was 12. Okay. Yeah. So that's where that's where the accent is a little bit more ingrained because your English accent is more prominent. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a mix. People say I sound Australian. Which I'm like, <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but when I first moved to the UK, yeah. I could speak like only very basic English. So that was kind of an interesting experience, kind of getting thrown into a completely new country, culture, school, you know, mm. without really um, having mastered the language yet. So I would say that that was kind of like my first real travel experience, except it was real life, you know. Yeah. And, that is an um, amazing travel experience. So. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, a few years later, obviously, things became, you know, it was just kind of, it just became life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that, not knowing the language, um, that really kind of inspired me to learn more languages. And um, so I ended up studying French and German at university in the UK. Mm. And then I think partly that's kind of what was responsible for having the confidence to then just go out into the world and not worry too much about, you know, communicating with people and kind of making my way, navigating my way across the world. And that, I find that so interesting. And when I was researching your bio, the languages did come up and I found that so, so was your interest in language just understanding these other cultures or it, was it because you did want to go to those places you wanted to travel? Yeah, I think honestly there was that subconscious element of wanting to travel mm. that I just didn't quite know yet at mm. that time. But um, the travel bug is something that I've really had like kind of running in my family. Mm. <laughs> and um, so when we kind of, you know, kind of fast forward uh, a couple of decades, 
I decided to kind of quit my job in London, go traveling. You mentioned Nepal. That was my very first destination mm. when I started traveling full time. And, you know, like people often ask me, oh, what inspired that? Like, were, you know, why did you want to travel? And I think it all kind of goes back to my grandfather who back when Poland was still under communist rule, um, managed somehow to find his way out of the country and travel around the world, which was very, very difficult at that time. Interesting. I mean, those were the times in Poland where like you couldn't even have your passport at mm. home. You had to store your passport at the police station. Interesting. And then ask for permission, um, apply for like official permission to even leave the country. And so my grandpa did that. Um, against all odds, against all restrictions. Mm. It's very difficult. Before Google Maps, before the internet, before like even travel sales agents. And he would go to countries that, you know, back then, again, for Poland, were like extremely remote, like Mexico, China, um, Kenya, you That's know? incredible. Yeah, and what's even more incredible, and this is kind of where my and my grandpa's stories merge is that whenever he came back from his trips and they were like, usually, they're usually pretty long trips, um, a month, two months, three months, he would write up travel chronicles from those trips. Mm. So very detailed um, kind of reports of the whole trip, what he did, how he felt, what he experienced. Mm. And he would kind of decorate the travel chronicles as he called them with like photos and postcards and souvenirs and I just remember when I was a kid, I would like sit there and just lose myself in these travel chronicles, you know? And Do you still have them? Yeah. Does your family still have them? We have all of them. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So whenever I'm uh, back home, I just always like make some time to sit down mm. and kind of look at them again. And when my grandfather passed away when I was seven years old, um, I feel like I kind of kept that part of him in me. Like that's because I always really looked up to him. He was my biggest role model and I feel like that was my way of kind of holding on to him after his passing mm. and so I grew just really really attached to them and also to him <laughs> and um, I think that's kind of how it all started because he really inspired me with his writings and his storytelling mm. that I feel like I just just kind of decided to do that yeah um, as well just in a very different format and, you know. and what was his name his name was Leszek so, yeah, thank you, Leszek, for helping to inspire Eva. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how people in our lives can be such an inspiration. And I, mm. I've shared the story on the podcast before, but I remember being at the border of uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and we picked up a Russian hitchhiker, and she left with $5 in her pocket. Wow. But the com she was so compelled to see the world. And I think that sometimes that is innate within us. Sometimes we learn it along the way, but it very much seems like it was innate to your grandpa and to you. Yeah. Like yeah. you had to do it. Yeah, it, I definitely didn't know it back then, of course. Yeah. And it only like really hit me a couple of years back when I was kind of trying to think, oh, well, why, why do I love, like, why, why am I even doing this? You know, like, what is the real reason? And then that, that's, that kind of, that's kind of when it clicked. Mm oh, well, of course it was him, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so I like to think that he's still somewhere around here, somewhere with me. And do you have <laughs> something of his that you travel with? Uh, yes, I have, like, a tiny little um, blue beetle that he got me from Egypt many, Amazing. many years ago. So that's that's in the truck, yeah. Uh, that's good. So he's, he's along for the journey yeah. in, in many ways, for Always. sure. Uh, and so a, a trip to Nepal would be very unusual because it is such a different culture and it's a very different uh, demographic than you would experience in the London area. What did you, what did you feel about that first trip? What did that, how did that change you or start to change you as a traveler? Mm. You know, Nepal is a kind of interesting destination because I went there straight from a very profound personal crisis mm. just prior to that trip. Um, you know, like I, for five years before that, I was working in London, like between London and Brussels. I was a manager at like a very high, like high growing, fast growing startup. Um, I was very successful, I was making really good money, you know, enjoying all the like privileges and um, glamour of, of, of living in London. Yeah. 
and I was married as well. So it was a very different kind of life. And um, there came a time where I just kind of started questioning everything in my life and what I was doing and why I was in that relationship that I was in and, and kind of came very slowly and gradually and painfully to the conclusion that um, I was doing it all for the wrong reasons. Mm. I kind of ended up on this, I, I like to call it like the highway of life. And there were all these exits all around me, but I just never took them. I was just kind of like so laser focused on being this person, mm. this like successful London, you know, media manager person yeah, with sure. a great sparkling stellar, you know, personal life. And that I just, I was just completely blind mm. to my own like happiness. I was just doing these things without really thinking about why I was doing them. I was doing them for the status, mm. basically. And when I realized that, of course, when you realize something like that, you, you can cannot know, unsee it. You yeah. can't unsee it, yeah. And either you choose to just just do it anyway because mm. it's it's easy, <laughs> or you have to make a change. And so I decided to make a change. And um, so Nepal was kind of interesting because that's when I decided that I'm going to go and do this travel vlogging thing. I'm going to start making videos and and travel storytelling like my grandpa. Mm. And um, <laughs> Nepal is a bit of a cliche destination for that, honestly. It's <laughs> kind of like eat, pray, love. But you we know? don't know that, though. <laughs> we just don't know that in the beginning. And that's just, it's okay. So true. <laughs> it's just okay. Yeah, it was like it was kind of like this cliche of this yeah. like. 25 year old London girl like going out into the world to like find herself you know sure. <laughs> and now I see that but um but I think it was necessary because I think some of these experiences we just really need them and I needed that I needed a Nepal in my life at that stage mm. and so I went on the Everest base camp trek and it was so hard at that time you know because again I just came straight from the city and didn't know anything about hiking and I sure. went on this big hike just because my friend told me to and yeah. <laughs> That is a big hike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my first hike is going to be to Everest Bakes Base Camp. Yeah, Literally. There you go. I like it. I it's like, 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 what are you thinking? And it was and it was really hard in so many ways, physically and mentally and emotionally. And 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 it was just just that like trigger that I needed mm. to um, realize, oh my God, it's hard, but I love it. Like yes. I love being out in nature. This is so amazing, so beautiful, so awe-inspiring. Mm. And so I think that that trip as cliche as it was, um, really kind of set a direction for me in terms of, like, I just realized how much I love nature and adventure and wild things, something mm. that the city just never gave me before. So um, that's kind of... To get out of the comfort. Yeah. Otherwise, we're yeah. in 70, well, in Fahrenheit, we're in 72 degrees mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. We have everything we need. The food yep. is prepackaged. Yep. It all tastes good. There's no hardship. No hardship. Exactly. And I think, I think human beings were wired for a little bit of that. Like we don't mm -hmm. want to seek out those, we don't want to seek out something negative, but I think hardship can be very positive actually. Yes, so. absolutely. I mean, it pushes you to learn about yourself, yeah. learn what you're capable of, things that you never thought you'd be capable mm -hmm. of, right? It forces you to enter that, that kind of fear mm. and, and push through it despite, despite it, right? Yeah. What was the first thing that you were afraid of that you did push through that you that you look back and you think I'm really proud of myself for overcoming that so this is going to sound really trivial but I think it's actually something that a lot of people struggle with um you know a lot of people like in the content sphere uh, let's put it that way um for me or something that was really really difficult was like being out in public and filming myself talk to a camera out yeah, in sure. public for the first time yeah. oh my god that was so awkward i just felt so awkward i was like oh my god everybody's staring at me like mm. i'm just talking to my camera everybody thinks i'm like super weird <laughs> like <laughs> you know and um does it still feel awkward no not right. really totally, i mean sometimes still totally feels awkward to me. <laughs> I'm like what am i doing i'm that guy right now hello scott yeah. welcome to my vlog <laughs> exactly <laughs> but the more you do it the more you realize yeah, no, that like true. people true. people don't care no anywhere near as much as you think right no. <clears throat> yeah about anything people don't care about anything that you're doing no. they care about what they're doing yeah and if they if they stare it's usually because they're curious mm -hmm. not because they're judging you you know so um that was like at the very start of this YouTube journey. Um, I remember like distinctly the first video that I ever made. It was actually in my hometown. 
So I'm, and this is in Poland. Poland is like relatively conservative. It's not like in the US where, you know, you do whatever you want. Like people will still look at you weird in Poland. So I'm just like walking around town with this camera and just talking into the camera in English, you know, and people are just like, <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, stop looking at, I'm just trying to make a video. Um, and that video is still up on my channel. It's the first video ever. Um, and it is awkward and you can tell that I'm feeling awkward in the video as well. But, um, but you just, again, you just have to push through these things and, and just do them anyway. But that, I think that's one of the things that I hadn't had the chance to see your channel until just a few days ago. And mm -hmm. I, that was one of the things that was a takeaway from me is I can see that in the very beginning you were trying to figure out who you were, mm -hmm. but you were also still being very honest to that fact, but you're more, more current content is very much you it seems like you're not trying to put on too much of a facade yeah I think that's important though yeah it's so true but it takes a lot of time and practice and I think a lot of people never get there because yeah. it is excruciatingly difficult to be honest on mm. social media yeah. it is I think one of the most difficult things that anyone can do mm. because you are out there putting yourself out there in a really vulnerable place and people judge, people mm. judge. And, um, you know, there's comments, there's comment sections, and there's, there's a general sense of energy that you get as well. Um, so I think for the first couple of years on social media, I was making videos not so much about myself, um, but about, you know, kind of the places that I was visiting. That was the idea. It was travel content mm -hmm. in that kind of typical travel sense. Like I was a presenter of the place. I wasn't Ava doing my yeah. life thing you know yeah. I was I was presenting the place yeah. and um, so I did that for a couple of years and then kind of eventually um, started realizing that I don't want to be presenting anything to anyone all I want to present at most is just maybe just my life that's mm. all I can present so to speak mm -hmm. of course that's not a very good word to use maybe um, I would say like the only story that I can tell is my own story mm. um, that's kind of what I realized um, a little while into the whole YouTube journey, but um, but it wasn't easy because every time you put yourself out there as a human with weaknesses and strengths, but also weaknesses, um, you are kind of exposing something that up until then was very personal and private mm. and that only maybe the people that were closest to you knew about. Mm. Now it's out there for millions of people to see and comment on mm. and make up their mind and make their judgments. So, um, yeah, but I don't regret it. And I found kind of ways to deal with that pressure as well. Um, so what are some examples of how you deal with that pressure? I only read YouTube comments for the first hour after I publish each video and then I stop reading. Um, I think Joe Rogan's got it. He did he post and ghost. Yeah. <laughs> And people are like, why don't you read the comments? And I'm like, have you seen the comments? <laughs> like, I would definitely need a therapist every time I sit down to read the comments. Just can't do that. It's, dif it's difficult. But yeah. the first hour is an interesting idea because it's probably your subscribers. Yes. Which means that they already have a an appreciation for what you do or mm -hmm. connection to your story. And they're likely to be a little more thoughtful. That's exactly it. They know the context. They know the background, right? Rather than a complete stranger sure. who is a first timer to your content comes in there and just like writes a thoughtless comment because they just have no idea yeah. what you're about. So that's exactly it. You got it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we get a lot of negative comments on our stuff, but it's usually like Ford suck or something, <laughs> something just so ridiculous that it, yeah. you know, like I literally can't be too offended by it. Like every once in a while, somebody will say that I, you know, look ridiculous or something, but it, it does make me laugh, but I can see why, having so much of yourself personally out mm -hmm. there can be challenging, but yeah. that's a, that's a good suggestion mm -hmm. that first hour. And then you kind of let it go yeah. into the universe after that. I mean, yeah. you know, you kind of got to get on with your life and, um, start focusing on the creative and productive stuff for like the next episode rather than the reactive stuff yeah. following an episode that you've already created a story that you've already put out into the world. Right. So yeah, yeah, it, it's, it works. And that is the challenge with social media is you can spend so much time on social media mm -hmm. that you don't actually get to produce the content that you need to post exactly. to social media. So I think having those boundaries 
are really important. Yeah, I remember um, a YouTube friend shared a really great piece of advice with me a little while back, and he said, this was like during a really like bad hate campaign uh, a few years back. He was like, the more you give in to that hateful energy, the more they're winning because they're taking away your creative energy mm. from you. You are just sitting there reacting, 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 and you are draining yourself of yeah. all the amazing things that you could be doing with that energy right now, creating beautiful things. Yeah. And so I think that was kind of the moment where I was like, yeah, you're right. I just got to focus on on being, on on making, on creating, not you know sitting there and kind of giving into negativity. So. No, that's smart. It's why I took most of the social media channels off my phone, and now they're only on my Ooh, iPad. Ooh, nice. So it gives, it does give another lo- level of boundary for me. I love that. Because we get a lot of comments, and yeah. if I sit down with the iPad, then I'm being intentional about I'm going to work yeah. for an hour or so, and then I'm going to put it away. Great idea. As opposed to it just like this constant loop. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, you talk a little bit about traveling. A Vilk is on the loose. Oh, no, he's back down again. He's like, uh, this is nice and comfortable over here. He loves the Defender, obviously. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, we'll talk about your Defender in a little bit <laughs> as well. Um, you talk in, on your, on your uh, website about traveling wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. And I can see some of that coming out in our comment, commentary so far. But what are other things that you do? It, like, what's your process or, or meditation or whatever it is that you do to help yourself feel like on most days that you are traveling wholeheartedly? Mm, yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's all about, um, I know that this journey is my life. So I try and stay present in it as much as possible. And one kind of thing that I've learned along the way that has really helped me do that is I stopped expecting the road to help me like find myself. Um, I used to think that, you know, going traveling, I would like find myself. Mm. <laughs> and that's so common though. Yeah. It's super common. Yeah. To want that. But kind of recently I realized that I don't, I don't ever want to find myself. I mean, it would be very sad if mm. I found myself because that would mean that I stopped changing, mm. that this is it for me. This is, this is now the static me that will forever be me. I don't want that, mm. you know? Um, and so I think like for me, every day on the road is an opportunity to, to seek a new part of myself, to learn something about the world, about myself, about whatever. Um, and to kind of like just be so immersed in that journey to take as much from it as I possibly can. Mm. Um, even if it's just, just a moment of feeling really, really present, you know, I feel like that has the potential to change you. And, um, so kind of that's kind of what I do, I guess. I just just try and be still sometimes and and just let the road do its thing and and be really receptive to it. I think like I just try and stay open. Um, well, and yeah. the the interesting reality is that the only version of ourself that exists is the one in this very moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The version that was years ago that's gone. Yeah. And actually we have no idea what we're going to be or if we'll even be here yeah. in the next moment. Mm-hmm. So the only version of ourself that we actually get to enjoy is the version right now as totally. we're talking on a to- on a podcast. Yeah. So like that's the only version of ourself that we get. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people sell that short. They don't appreciate who they are in the moment, that they're healthy and that they're breathing and that they're aware and that they're maybe having an interesting conversation. Yeah, exactly. Those moments are pretty powerful. Yeah. Um you travel solo mm-hmm. now, although you do have a recent addition, which we'll talk about, Vilk, in a, in a little moment. Yeah. But um, what what made you choose to do that, and how have you found that that has influenced your travel or changed you by traveling solo? Mm. You know, when I started traveling alone and making YouTube videos, um, part of the reason why I wanted to do what I did is was because... I saw that there was a big empty space on YouTube um, where there should be adventurous women doing adventurous stuff alone. Absolutely. There are loads of women like that and there always have been. Just at that time, not so many of them were making videos on YouTube for people to watch and see and get inspired by. 
there was a lot of guys doing great stuff, just not so many girls. So I kind of made it my mission to do that because I was like, well, I mean, is it just, is it because people are not interested? No, that can't be it. Um, is it just because just nobody has done it quite so consistently yet? And so I decided to become that person to kind of like create this niche of solo female travelers who go to off the beaten path destinations. I'm not talking about like Thailand or Bali, you know, that's a whole other thing. Um, I went to places like Pakistan and Iran and Iraq and kind of like, I wanted to show that women can go to those places, can have a great time because look at this girl, yeah. <laughs> she's having an awesome time. She's and doing she's, it. Yeah, she's doing it, yeah. exactly. So I kind of wanted to share that sense of, you know, like possibility with mm. the world. And again, there are loads of women doing all those things already, but just not so much on social media back then. And so I really like, I feel like um, that was kind of my fuel at that stage. Trail, trailblazer, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, I mean, I wasn't really trailblazing anything. I was just... just on social media. Well, I was just yeah. sharing it on social yeah, media. Sure. And um, yeah, and that's kind of what really inspired me and fueled me from the get-go. Yeah. And that's kind of also why I just never wanted to give up my solo female traveling ways because I feel like my job is not done yet. Mm. And there's still so many things that I can show that women can do. And I know it's a little bit different here in the United States, but like, again, just coming from a slightly different background um, and again, having traveled to places like Pakistan, India and, and, you know, a lot of really conservative countries where women don't have those same possibilities or, you know, opportunities. And so, like, I would say that one of the best parts of my work is when I get a message from someone saying, Oh, hey, um, so I was, you know, my family and I watched your videos and they let me go on this trip by myself, you know, because of your videos mm. or like or a father emailing me saying, hey, like I was just encouraging my daughter to like go and travel on her own because of your videos, because you can do it so she can do it as well. Mm. So having that is I find just really empowering and really beautiful and yeah. And that's so important. So important. Yeah. So I'm just probably just going to keep traveling on my own because I feel like there's there's a lot of meaning in there for a lot of people too. And it seems like it's working s super well for you. I mean, and it, and it doesn't mean that you don't get to meet people along yeah, the way. Exactly. That, so you're actually never alone, alone yes. yeah. um, for big chunks of time. Exactly. You get to interact with people probably even on a daily basis. I would say traveling alone, you traveling solo, yeah. you're never alone yeah. because there's so many opportunities to meet people everywhere. Sure. And it's actually probably even easier to meet people when you're on your own because you're not like, you know, usually when you're traveling with a group or even with a partner, you kind of like stick together and sure. like that's enough company, right? But when you're alone, you kind of seek out other people and you maybe stay in hostels where there's always other travelers. Mm -hmm. And so I just find it a lot easier to actually meet others. Um, and it's, you know, and if you're a bit introverted, like it's perfect because it gives you that balance of like, <laughs> oh, you can have your me time and then you can go out there and explore the world. You know? And would you... I mean, because you also do seem very extroverted. So you like the extroverted introvert? Yeah, I'm one of those. Yeah, I'm totally, yeah. That one. <laughs> totally that way. Totally that way. So let's talk about Vilk. When did you um, get your puppy? And so, he's still a, he still looks like a puppy. I he's know. just a big big puppy. Huge puppy. Um, I got here five months ago. Okay. In Montana, and I like I've always wanted to have a dog. I just I've, I'm obsessed with dogs and. Um, the part of the big reason why I started traveling over land with my rig is because I knew that eventually I would want to introduce a dog into my life and travel the world with a dog. So that's kind of also why I stopped, you know, taking planes. Mm. Part of the reason why I stopped taking planes and, um, and all that stuff. And so, yeah, he's been with me for five months and I'm just getting him used to traveling, traveling the world. <coughs> he's a pretty well-traveled dog already. Well, and he's... For how young he is, he's so well trained. When we were <laughs> earlier, for those that are listening, when we were walking into the studio, uh, Vilk, he stopped at the threshold to go into the building, and you know, Ava just said, "Okay, you can." What did you say? What free? Kind of, free. 
And then he went in. The, I've never seen a dog do that ever where they like stopped at a door. Uh, so that was really impressive Thanks. to he's watch. A good, he's a good boy. Oh, I, but yeah, I can see how hard you're working on that because he is going to be exposed to so many new things mm -hmm. and he's going to be in, in places that could be unsafe for him. Yeah. Like around roads and other dogs and, and things like that where or military checkpoints or whatever mm. where he needs to behave in a certain way. Exactly. So I can see why you take that so seriously. Very seriously. Yeah. It's like, I, you know, I, um, I never wanted to be a mom. Like I never wanted to have kids, but I feel like I've just been tricked into having a kid. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> it kind of feels like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I love the little guy, but yeah, he's a handful for sure. Uh, yeah. Well, that's great. So, and then what do you, how do you feel like that changed your travels, introducing a pup to your, to your life? Um, <clears throat> In the good ways and the bad. Yeah. So uh, the obvious bad ways uh, would be um, you can't go into like restaurants or, or shops or, you know, museums and things like that. That's fine. But like, I don't really care. So it doesn't really affect me very much. There is, you know, you can't go on hikes in national parks. Um, but again, I don't really like national parks so much. Like I don't like the restrictive vibe yeah, <laughs> of sure. national parks. So again, that's not something that I really mind. Um, and one thing that definitely for me personally, like was a huge change is that I now have to plan things. Ah, gotcha. I am like be quite as, uh, yeah. as free flowing. Yeah. yeah. Like I never used to plan anything. I would just like go and then stop wherever, you know? And, um, now I actually have to plan because I know I, he can't be in the car for too long or like we need to be here, like, you know, all this stuff. So I feel like it's made me more responsible, <laughs> <laughs> uh, more like just, uh, dogs make us better humans. I think they, they really do. <laughs> yes, I think so. they so do. Yeah. And honestly, like he filled a gap that I didn't even know I had. Mm. Like, it's amazing. Just, just having this little like fluff ball. You can just keep you company, makes you smile totally. and laugh. They make you laugh. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so like, I now can't really imagine my life without him. I think it would just feel a bit more empty. So, yeah. and he needs you. So yeah. it's nice to be needed yeah, it's and to sweet. have that structure. Totally. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it's like, I would say it's, it's very hard. It's mm. really hard, especially on the road. Like, you know, um, the other month I was up in Alaska with a couple of friends. We we're traveling to Prudhoe Bay and they're also on a defender and they're a couple. Right. And it was kind of funny to see the comparison between their truck and my truck. So their truck was always like pristinely clean. <laughs> it was just, just so nice. You know, there was like space. Like you could actually see like the little hallway in the back, you know, <laughs> sure. like you could see the seats. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> it wasn't like junk lying on yeah. the seats and it was just always so nice and clean. And then you look at my truck and it's just filled with dog hair, dog toys, like dog food everywhere, you know, yeah. just a mess all the time. Sure. And so in a way, you know, you kind of give that up as well. You kind of give up <laughs> that pristine cleanliness and yeah. you just have to manage the chaos a little bit somehow, you know, and, um, yeah, that's definitely changed. But I'm I'm a very chaotic person, so I don't particularly well, mind that. It seems like that's another fun way to show your audience that reality again. Yes. Like my truck is not Instagram it perfect is not. every minute. No. It's it, got puppy hair everywhere and there's drool all across the window. Oh, and, the drool <laughs> on the window. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that that's another neat way to show people like how real life is when you're traveling yeah. around the world. And I, th and I think a lot of people want to travel with their dogs Yeah. or they would love to travel with the dog. So I think that it's, that's another option that you have to inspire people to, right. to do that for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, it's, it's doable, but it, you definitely need to be very, very committed. Yeah. Um, so only for the not faint of heart. <laughs> but it seems to be more common, which is good. Yeah. So people are starting to do that more often. Yes. They're starting to travel more often with dogs, which yeah. I think is really, really fun. Yeah. So speaking of kind of life on the road, um, one of the challenges for many of us as content creators is how do we get work done when we travel? So you produce, do you also edit your own videos as well? Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's really nice to have. Yeah. So that's someone that's supporting you. Do you have any other support roles that are making life a little easier for you? Yeah. So the first two years of my mm, kind of YouTube journey, 
I did everything by myself. So filming, editing, being my own accountant, like being my own business manager, all that stuff, right? Because I mean, you're starting out. So you, 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 like I didn't have the budget to hire anyone. And also it's great because you get to learn about every single step of the process. So you become a real expert at your own business, basically. Mm. So um, yeah, I did that, f- actually three years, um, did that all by myself. And then I came to a point in my life where I realized I am not publishing videos on a weekly basis. I'm not being consistent. I am not making the videos that I'd like to be making because I don't have time to make them beautiful and amazing. Is that my dog? Oh, no, no he's sleeping. The, <laughs> okay. It's the door, yeah. <laughs> um, And so I was just finding myself more and more overwhelmed and kind of like on the verge of burnout. So my channel was growing really fast. I was traveling to all these amazing places, but like I would just film and then go back to my hotel room and then just have to sit there and edit, edit, edit for like half the night, wake up the next day, go, 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 then go back, edit, edit. And it was just such a, I felt like I had created this life a freedom for myself, but I was taking that freedom away from me because I was restricting myself because I didn't have time to enjoy it, you know? So I was making videos, but it was just so draining. Mm. And um, that's kind of when I decided to make a change and eventually found an editor who's been working with me for two years. And she, she now, like we work very closely on each edit, of course, you know, each video has, you know, I kind of film it and then we kind of go through through the concept and the script together and then she kind of puts together the first version and then we do feedback loops and all that kind of good stuff. So it's still very collaborative and it's still very me, but having an editor now that I found my voice on social media um, just really helps me um, actually be able to enjoy my life as well. A yeah, bit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And Which is nice. <laughs> super nice. Yeah. And then, and do, where do they live in the world? So she lives in Slovenia. Okay. In so, yeah. and then, so the only thing you have to deal with probably right now is the time change. Yes. Is which a little is, bit more of a challenge. Which is actually quite nice because like I send her the stuff and then I go to sleep and then when I wake up, she sends me something. Surprise. Yeah. yeah there's something to check out. So it actually works pretty well. And in addition to Raya, um, who like, I just, she's like the most important person in my life. Um, in addition to Everybody's Raya. Everybody's got to have a Raya or a Paula. Totally. Or else life does not continue. Yeah. Um, I also have a couple of other people working with me. Um, so I have um, Lola who works with me on like the logistics and, and business stuff as well. Mm. And there's Carol who works on my other YouTube channel, um, which is a whole other thing. So yeah. So there's, it, we're like a, small team um which but is quite nice but it also allows you to like have a relaxed morning walk your dog yeah exactly yeah that's have great ho- have like hobbies yeah. you know and so then how do you how do you structure your work week do you just kind of um when the opportunity arises to get work done do you do it or do you do you schedule like a day i'm gonna work on wednesday or yeah um since i usually upload videos on saturdays i always 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 make sure that on Friday, I am somewhere with good internet access so I can upload that video, mm. um, write up the title, the thumbnail, you know, kind of prepare the video. And then usually I like to be online on Saturday when it goes live as well, that so sense. that I can kind of see how it goes, you know? Um, so that's like, that, I'll say that, like, that that's the one thing. Yeah. <laughs> but other than that, no, I mean, with the, you know, when you're out on the road, it's kind of hard to predict things. Even if you plan ahead, sometimes it, the road is just so long and so empty that you can't find a place to sit down and work sure. you know so you just have, kind of have to adjust so i just kind of t- take it as it comes you know and you said <laughs> when we when we were walking this morning you said that um yesterday was your longest driving day yeah. you think in your whole trip yeah 300 mo- miles wow yeah in a defender 110 <laughs> yeah that's that is a lot of miles it was long <laughs> but yeah i try not to like do these extremely long drive days unless I absolutely have to. Sure. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, I like to just be able to enjoy, you know. Yeah, sure. And take my time. Uh, yeah. that's, well, that's, and that's part of the reason why you're traveling. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about, speaking of the Defender, let's talk a little mm. bit about that. So what made you decide on traveling around the world in a Land Rover Defender? <laughs> It was this. It wasn't this. <laughs> well, that, that's every Land Rover owner. Yeah, yep, literally. You, you bought with your heart, not with your head. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's it, it's um, one of those decisions that you make, which are like, 
it's, it's just an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. It is not a rational decision at all. Mm -hmm. If I was making a ration, rational decision, I probably would have bought a van, honestly. <laughs> it would have been much easier, much sure. more comfortable. Yeah. But I just, like, that car just has soul. It just has it something really special. Like, every time I sit in that truck, I have a smile on my face, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I didn't think that would happen with a van. It would just be, it would just be a van. Yeah. This is Odyssey. The defender, you know, <laughs> my baby, my girl. <laughs> so, <And> what's <laughs> the what's the statement on the side of it? Something about the brave. The world belongs to the brave. There we go. Yeah, and I think buying a Defender 110 to drive around the world solo is a brave act. <laughs> totally. As I as I look at my own leaking Defender over, <laughs> here, over here in the corner. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, it's it's just one of those cars that really. I know it's just a car, but it's also not just a car because it really brings people together. For sure. Like they do make people smile. They do. Everybody's got a story about a Land Rover. Absolutely. Yeah. And whenever I come across other travelers in who are also traveling in a Defender, like I just know 95% chance they're going to be pretty great people because, <laughs> you know, they're putting themselves through the same thing that mm -hmm. I am. Like they didn't get the car with their heads. They got the car with their hearts um, and they're willing to put up with whatever crap that car throws their way on a very long journey. So, um, I've like I've always had just great experiences with the uh, the Land Rover community and, mm -hmm. and the people driving those cars, so no regrets. And they tend to, in my experience, like for example, for Overland Journal, a lot of our contributions to the magazine are from people who own Land Rovers because they tend right. to be artistic as well. Right. They're attracted to the way that the vehicle looks. Yeah. The way that the vehicle feels, mm -hmm. um, the history, the legacy of the brand. Yeah. They're attracted to all of those things. Um, so I, I, I actually think that there's advantages to the traveler to driving a Land Rover because you, you may break down more often, which means you interact with the locals more often. Yeah, You great. allow for some serendipity, <laughs> oftentimes, yes. unexpected. And it's not an adventure until something goes wrong. So, I know. So it's the guy who goes around the world in a Land Cruiser. I mean, is he really having an adventure? I don't think so. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. The, the world needs to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, you know, when I, when I got the Defender, it was like my comment section on YouTube was just flooded, yeah. flooded with just people being like, why didn't you get a line crew? Did you get a Toyota? <laughs> like, That's not the point. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, no. Yet no, you are the one that is actually driving around the world. Right. So yeah. I think that you win that argument. I know. Yeah. And again, no regrets. I think it's... Um, she has served me really, really well, and she's just my sole car. So, and it looks like so you have a not to go too much into the weeds on the truck, but it looks like you have an Alu cab mm -hmm. that pops up into a camper. Yeah, and is that something that you had installed, or did it already have it on there? No, when I got the car, um, there was really nothing in it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, yeah, just everything that is livable about the car. Um, that was part of the, the journey. Mm. So actually Odyssey, my truck went through two versions. So this is actually Odyssey 2.0 <laughs> okay. that you're seeing. Actually, I should say 3.0 because when I first got her, she was very plain, um, just had like a little roof rack, which we took off. And the first kind of Odyssey 1.0 was, um, we, I got a roof rack and like a roof tent from front runner. So I put that on and, um, also built a little kind of like lifestyle interior with my uncle who's a carpenter and um so that kind of made odyssey livable so i had the rooftop tent but i could also sleep inside mm -hmm. i had some cupboards inside it was pretty basic nice but basic and um served me pretty well did like a big trip around um the balkans and turkey and ukraine and like around the black sea three months kind of just like a recce and uh, it was great, but I started seeing issues with the rooftop tent. Mm. I knew that if I wanted to go on a really, really long trip, a rooftop tent would probably not be the best idea, just because it's very sensitive to the weather, you know, it's not very comfortable, you have to set it up every it time. It takes a long time to set up, most of them do. Yeah, and like the fastest I think I got to setting it up from scratch was seven minutes, I timed myself. <laughs> that was like the fastest. And like, okay, seven minutes doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're doing it every single day and it's really windy and raining, it actually yeah. is. Um, so I knew that I really, wanted to find an alternative solution. So when I got to the States this year, um, I started working on Odyssey 2.0, which um, was a complete rebuild of everything. I had the Alucab installed in Oregon and then did a 
whole overhaul of the interior to kind of fit with the Alu Cab oh, also nice. in Oregon. Nice. So we rebuilt absolutely everything. And um, kind of like, it's interesting because when you start overlanding in a truck like that, you think you know what you want. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> you have to do that recce trip, ideally for like a month or two, sleeping in a car every night, um, living in it every day to kind of figure out, okay, well, these are the things that are just not working and these are the things that are, and this is what I need and this is what I want. So that was really great that I did that and I would definitely recommend it to anyone. So once we did Odyssey 2.0, I, I knew exactly what I needed, what I wanted, what worked, what didn't. Now I would say that she's like, like this is the ultimate. Like, I don't think I need anything else. She's great. Like I've been living in this car now full time after the kind of rebuild for for five months, four or five months. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Went to Alaska. Perfect. Went to the desert. Perfect. It was so great. So, and then yeah. how do you, how do you keep it warm on the inside? Do you have a little heater or? Yes, I have a diesel heater. Well, there yeah. we go. So yeah. you're set. Balmy. <laughs> <laughs> this content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. So uh, beyond the truck, what are some of the things, like if you were to, like if there was a fire and you had to grab like your five favorite things, like what are your, what are your most favorite pieces of kit? or that have helped you in your journey. Mm -hmm. Like, so somebody that's listening is thinking this person has traveled around the world now mm -hmm. for years. What are, what are the things that you really have found makes travel better for you? Well, there's a difference between that and grabbing stuff when there's a fire. <laughs> I'll probably grab my dog, you know, my passport. That's true. That's so true. And, but then that, I guess at the end of the day, that's probably all we need. Yeah. You right? need your dog and a passport. Exactly. Maybe your phone. <laughs> so maybe that's all that, all, those are the, all the important yeah. stuff. But what are the things that have kind of, like br brought a smile to your face or made your travels more enjoyable or mm -hmm. easier easier yeah so there's a lot of things that have that like make my life daily life easier that I just I think I would grow really frustrated if I didn't have them so my uh water filter okay. uh, for water that's great it's a lifesaver filter um really essential my water tank uh, which holds, I think, 40 liters of water, okay. which is amazing. It means you can be more self-sufficient on the road for a, like long stretches of time. I and mean, 40 liters for one person and a dog is a, is a lot. Yeah, sure. You know, it's not like I'm sitting there taking showers and it does it. Things like, uh, what else? The diesel heater is also fantastic. A fridge. So in Odyssey 1.0, I didn't have a fridge. Um, I just had, your life. yeah, I had a cool <laughs> box. And now, I mean, oof, I know it's, it is game changing. It's something, it's something different. Yeah. Um, so that's, that stuff is really great. Other than that, things that I kind of carry around, carry around with me. I mean, obviously my camera, um, really, really important, but also my journals. So I, um, try and write some, at least something every day, but try and keep a record of the general journey. Um, yeah, so that in honor of your grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So again, if there was a fire in my truck, one of the other things that I would definitely bring with me would be the little stash of journals that I've yeah. written on this, on this trip so far. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so, um, you talk a little bit about in your content about sustainable travel mm -hmm. and that has become something that we're hearing a lot more about. Uh, how do you see sustainable travel and how do you bring that to bear for yourself mm. where you feel like you're being sustainable? I am, um, a pessimist I think in this regard because I don't really believe in sustainable travel I don't mm -hmm. think it's possible un like truly uh, unless you are walking around the world mm -hmm. then maybe or cycling you know or horse riding <laughs> yeah. um, but for the vast majority of travelers including myself we are not traveling sustainably I mean come on like let's face it like okay I might not be taking planes 
or cruise ships, great, but I am still traveling in, um, in a truck around the Americas. I could be walking, right? Sure. <laughs> so, so slowly, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, um, tongue in cheek, because, you know, at the end of the day, of course, I still use very little water and my car doesn't actually consume that much fuel and I don't like And you bought a used vehicle so you didn't yeah. buy something brand new. Exactly. You recycled it. Exactly. Um it. and so I think, you know, definitely like <laughs> my journey is much more sustainable than people perhaps might assume that it is. Um but I do definitely struggle with the idea of like promoting sustainable travel. I think we got to be realistic that mm -hmm. it may not be sustainable. Uh, but we can give back in other ways. You know, you can kind of, um, you can, for example, I'm uh, mostly vegan. Um, so I know that changing my diet from, you know, kind of, I used to eat meat and I used to eat dairy every day. Now I never eat meat and I barely eat dairy. So I know that that, for example, reduces my carbon footprint in a major way, actually major way. Again, stop traveling by plane, that reduces it further. Um, so there's things that we can do um, to kind of make our travels more sustainable in that sense. But I think when I talk about sustainability in general on the internet, I don't actually mean it in an environmental, environmental sense. Yeah, I'm, I didn't think you did. Yeah, I meant um, the journey being sustainable for you as a human mm -hmm. um, without burning you out, um, the journey being sustainable in the sense that you're, you know, crossing the world while learning things, while growing as a person, um, rather than just hopping from one destination to the next and snapping pictures and being like, hey, I've been there. Like, you know, in that sense, that kind of like more conceptual, philosophical, personal sense. And then what have you done to help make it more sustainable for you? In that sense? Yeah. The, I think for me, the biggest change was... And this was a very risky change because I used to travel um, in that more like typical YouTube way. So like kind of like jumping from one destination to the next, like I don't know, take a flight from Miami to, um, I don't know, Egypt to Syria to whatever, you know? And I used to like change destinations a lot of the time. And I felt like there came a point in my life where I would travel so much for, I mean, for myself, but also for content, of course, that I would wake up every other day in the morning and it took me like 30 seconds to figure out where I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, and it's that, like- That can happen for sure. Yeah. Like what hotel room? Yeah. yeah you go have dinner and you, and you go to go back to the hotel and you have actually no idea yeah. where you're staying. Yeah. I've had that. Yeah. Sure. And it's like, I find that pe like people kind of laugh at it and some people find it even like glamorous. I found it horrifying. Mm -hmm. I just really found it really hard. I was yeah. like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, <laughs> I feel like I've just become completely rootless. And so I made that change. Like I realized that that's completely unsustainable. I'm going to get burnt out really quickly. I did a couple of times already. So I just knew that I needed a long journey over land that I could take at my own pace, where I could pace myself. Mm. I could be in my own home yep. on wheels uh, with my own stuff, you know, and not have to like rush to the airport, but just take it slow. Mm. And I, that was a game changer for me. Like I feel that was the best thing I could have done. And we, I feel like in this world of like consumer driven travel, where again, you're just encouraged to spend a weekend in Miami, then a weekend in, Portland then a weekend somewhere else you know like I just feel like we've lost touch with what travel is all about mm -hmm. travel is not about staying in a five-star hotel resort that is that's a trip that's a holiday mm. that's it's different a vacation. that's you're a vacation a tourist, yeah. exactly travel is about adventure when you're traveling not taking a holiday I'm talking traveling you have to put yourself in situations where you might not be certain about something. You can't just go to a hotel where that hotel recreates exactly the style of your own house back home. You kind of, you're just, at that point, you're just creating an illusion of comfort in a place on the other side of the world where you've really, why did you go to that place? Was it? Should have just stayed home. Should have just stayed yeah. home. Yeah, <laughs> would have saved yourself a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so, and like, I don't mean this in, a reductionist way, I just mean that I think we have confused the holiday with the journey. Mm. Um, and I think there is a really big difference. 
Again, I'm not one of those people that would be like, oh, tourist versus traveler. That's not the point. The point is not to put people down. The point is to just know the difference and and be conscious about it. Anyway, yeah, that maybe, was... <laughs> maybe intentional. Yeah, intentional. Exactly. What, what, it is, what is it that I want to experience? Yeah. How do I want this to change me? Or do I want to just go on vacation? Totally. And drink Mai Tais at the pool? And Which is nothing great. Wrong with, there's Which nothing is wrong so with that. Which is so great. Yeah, I yeah. love that sometimes, you yeah. know, but I but know. But not to confuse the two. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There is a difference. Yeah. And um, yeah, I suppose that for me, like doing that big overland trip was making, it was less about uh, fitting my life around trips and more about m- synchronizing my life with mm the big journey and um so yeah so i guess i'm driving the pan-american highway now and then let's see what happens and that feels sustainable to you now yeah that i feel like i can do this for a very long time Uh, well hopefully you can that would be amazing yeah keep checking in on your travels (laughs) um so another thing that you have had kind of as a theme is this connection Mm -hmm. to others and communities how have you found that you best connect in with a new place so you're you're traveling into a, let's like maybe exclude America, but like somewhere else in the world and mm-hmm. you're coming into someplace very unique um, and you want to connect in with that community. What do you look for? What are you trying to, what are you hoping to achieve when you want to connect mm. with a new place? I feel like a big part of it is when you go to a place that you that is very distant culturally or whatever from, um, from your own culture or community, like what really helps me is when I go in there without really any expectations and try and clear my mind of any preconceived notions. I know it's very hard to do, very easy to say, very hard to do, but um, it really helps because that way you can kind of look at someone else's life and, and kind of observe it without making rash judgments, without comparing it to your own. Sure. Um, and just kind of like open yourself up to, okay, this is how they do things. Oh, well, why is that? You know, kind of just absorbing another culture. Mm. Um, so I've really found that that kind of helps me. And I think another thing, but that's kind of more specific to what I do, which is filmmaking, is, you know, every time I go somewhere to like meet someone like if it, from a different community, the idea is usually to make a film about their life maybe or about their culture so for me it's also about kind of doing a bit of research beforehand to kind of like even some basic words in their language you know thank you hello goodbye whatever you know yeah and and it really helps to connect i think another thing that we totally underestimate um that i found wherever i go in the world just like a smile is a really good start you know it really does universal yeah yeah, it does bring people together Mm. A smile, a pat on the shoulder, like whatever, you know, just just being just normal, friendly, human, yeah. you know. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that's really helped me kind of connect to people all around the world. And it's something that everybody can do. Mm. It's it's really not a deep philosophy. And is that is that something that you find is one of your motivations to travel is to connect with new yeah. cultures? Yeah, I really feel like um, meeting people from around the world has helped me figure out um, who I want to be, you know, and what I want to be like to the world and to the people of the world and what kind of mission I want to communicate with everything that I do. So I would say that um, just becoming more open, more thoughtful, more more intentional, as you said before, um, I would say that that's something that the people that I've met around the world have largely given me. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's incredible how much of a gift we get from the places that we Mm. visit. And how often, tra- even travelers, do a poor job of giving back. Yeah. So what are some ways that you find that you're able to give back to those communities or, you know, cultures that you have enjoyed? Yeah. What are some things that you like to do? I think a very, very important thing that um, the tourism industry doesn't do enough of that I always try and focus on is um, finding local guides, you know, finding local projects and um, communities that you can you, know, you can go visit amazing places around the world with locals. I think one mistake that we make is kind of finding a kind of Western or American agency that arranges everything for us. And then the guide on the ground is, you know, he gets like a 10% cut on that, you know, like a tiny, tiny little percentage of all the work that he puts in just because we have chosen not to organize the trip by ourselves, but we have let 
a local agency that is like us organize it for us because we're too lazy or too uncertain to kind of do it by ourselves. And so whatever money we then spend on that trip ends up being largely in the hands of that Western agency. So it doesn't actually go and support the people that we're visiting. Um, it doesn't make the world necessarily a much better place. Let's just put sense. it that way. Sure. Uh, for example, um, a really great example, and I remember visiting this place when I was, I think, 15 or 16 years old. I was really young. I went to Angkor Wat in mm. Cambodia. Everybody knows it. It's beautiful. It's historical. It's just majestic. Um, and, you know, one of the like narratives that we tell ourselves in the travel and tourism world is that, well, the money that comes from tourism helps support these local communities. That's not quite true. Um, so even back then uh, in Cambodia, this was again before like the massive waves of tourism that descended upon Angkor Wat, even back then you could see that the local communities weren't exactly benefiting from all that money that was coming in from tourism. In fact, despite Angkor Wat being the biggest attraction in Cambodia um, and the thing that draws the most visitors to Cambodia, Siem Reap, which is the province, the town and province around there, is the poorest in Cambodia. It's the poorest, even though it attracts all the visitors mm. and should be technically the richest. It is not because most of the money is stays in the hands of foreign investors, foreign hotels, um, politicians. So I feel like we have to be really, really careful with how we spend our money when we travel. And that's kind of what I really am extremely picky about. For example, uh, a year ago, I went to Iran and um, did like a, did an amazing cultural experience, which was 100% locally owned, locally operated, um, not even, I think it's a nonprofit. Hmm. So basically I went to the mountains of the Zagros mountains of Iran and spent a week traveling by foot with some of the last nomadic people in Iran. Wow. So every, twice a year they do a big kind of like seasonal migration to uh, greener pastures with their flocks of sheep and goats. And um, you can join them as a tourist, as a traveler, you can. There's Incredible. one there's one local project that has spent years um, becoming friends with and creating kind of connect, personal connections with some of the nomadic families. So they've gained their trust and they give them amazing, like great financial incentives to actually bring tourists along. So you kind of go on this amazing experience that you'd never get access to in any other way mm. as a tourist. And it's mind bending. Like it's just so eye opening, kind of like that whole nomadic lifestyle of the mm. people um, in the Zagros Mountains. And so you're benefiting hugely because you're joining them on this really special journey and they benefit because they get a really good cut of the profit from that trip. They get to meet tourists who are usually very respectful and want to be there, you know? Sure. Um, so I just feel like I love That's to- That's a great example. Yeah, I love to promote these kinds of opportunities. There's loads of them all around the world. We just have yeah. to seek them out. And it so, provides yeah. financial incentive for them yeah. to retain as much of those original cultural components of, of their of their society as they can. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it doesn't allow them to have a smartphone, yeah. but it does sh show incentive of like, let's retain this yes. this heritage and this history of our, of our people. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's really amazing. <clears throat> One of the things that I love to ask is um, the books that you r have read or, or are currently reading that are the most inspiring or have changed your life in some way positive or made you laugh, whatever? Yeah, great question. I actually have a little um, highlights tab on my Instagram with all my book recommendations. So if someone oh, was okay. really interested all right, in... I like this. Yeah, there's, there's loads. Um, so I'm a massive bookworm. Um, again, I studied languages and literature at university. So um, there's a lot, but I would say that like the top two that I can think off the top of my head, um, one would be... Sapiens by Yuval Noah really Harari. Good. It's an amazing book. So That's that kind really of talks good. about like the history of humanity and how we got to where we are right now. Um, really amazing, but a very accessible and easy read, right? Very Just, good. Yeah, yeah, so good. Great for travelers to read. Yeah, so like, good. Where did all of this behavior come from? Yeah, why are we, <laughs> why are we like this? Yeah, why are we so <laughs> weird? <laughs> and the other one that is like my, like it's always in my car, except now because I just gave 
my last copy to someone else, but um, it's usually in my car, is The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Mm. So I know The Prophet sounds like religious. It's not a religious book. It's a very spiritual book. Um, it's like the poetry of life. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of, it's just so inspiring and beautiful and very philosophical in a very poetic way. Um, so I love to just kind of like dip into that book and just reread chapters here and there. So that's something that you've gone back to and read. Oh, yeah, yeah. plenty of times. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. And then um, in all of your travels, who would you say was the most inspiring person that you met? And they don't wow. have to be another traveler. Like the person that you literally, you think back on and you think, how did that happen? How did I get that opportunity to <gasps> interact with that other human being? Oh my God, there's so many. There's so many amazing people. Um, gosh, let me think. It's really hard to like mm, single out a single person. There's mm -hmm. definitely, like, I mean, I've already talked about the nomads of Iran. That family made a huge impression on me. But... Um, yeah, that's a great story. Yeah, but another kind of person that I think I would say made a really big impact on me was, um, so I was in Tanzania a couple of years ago, and uh, a friend of mine, she moved to Tanzania like, I don't know, a decade ago, and she met a guy who was a Maasai guy, and they married, and she moved to his village in Tanzania. So she she speaks fluent Maasai, she... Um, like she's part of the community very, very much, uh, which is kind of interesting because she's she's a German girl. She's you know, white I'm, white German girl. Is there a, is there a, <laughs> is there much of her story that's out there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I've read yes, it. That's yeah. a fascinating story. Yeah, she's she's just so interesting. And so I went to her village um, to kind of meet her and and her family, and um, I did an interview with her mom-in-law. She's a Maasai lady, and uh, so. I don't know if everybody knows, but the Maasai have, they live in a polygamous society. So um, unfortunately, it's only one way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, there's oh, like... that fair, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so basically, one man can have several different wives. And so I did an interview with uh, Stephanie's mother-in-law, Yayai, and Yayai uh, kind of shared her husband with three other wives, I believe. And I just used to find that concept so, like, horrifying, like... Polygamy in any way just seemed really horrifying. And then I kind of spoke to her and she explained how it kind of works. And I think what really opened my mind was how she said, when I asked her at some point, aren't you jealous of the other wives? Like, I'm so jealous. And she was like, no, we're really good friends. You know, we're a family, we support each other. And I just found that so like, wow. <laughs> so she was, I mean, she's inspiring in the sense that she kind of opened my eyes to how we can perceive different emotions through so many different lenses. My instinctive reaction was, I'd be so jealous. She showed me that in any relation, you don't have to be jealous. You can just take all the good things about it and focus on that. And, mm. and I think that applies really to anything. So it's a very specific example, but I feel like um, all of these cultural concepts that we surround ourselves with they're all relative, mm. right? It's all about how you look at them, whether that's relationships or body hair or like, and all of those things. And uh, so yeah, I think she was inspiring in, in a very big way to kind of, for me to reevaluate everything, really everything that I came to believe in. Um, so yeah, thanks, Yaya. Yeah, she maybe challenged some of those preconceived notions. Yeah, and I know it's it's a very different culture because it's still a very patriarchal culture that mm. she lives in. So it comes from a different place, but that doesn't mean that you can't that she can't kind of change your mind about something, right? Yeah, oh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last question, which will be helpful for all of those that are listening that are thinking about starting their own journey around the world, uh, maybe as a solo traveler. What advice, um, and there's two ways to frame it, what advice would you give to yourself if you were to go back seven, when, when, what year was it when you left for Nepal? <gasps> oh my God, uh, 2017 or 18, I, it was five years ago. Okay, yeah. so if, if you were to go back five years after all of this <laughs> travel and give yourself some advice, or if you were to be sitting down with, for tea or coffee, mm -hmm with a solo traveler that's getting ready to go around the world, what would you tell them? What key pieces of advice would you give them? Don't look for yourself. 
forget about looking for yourself. Just, just let the journey take you. Let the journey change you. Mm, observe, learn, tune in. Don't resist change. Um, yeah, and most of all, enjoy every moment. And I mean, really moment. Not enjoy the idea of the journey. Not enjoy getting from one place to the next, but really just stay still once in a while and mm. understand what, what an amazing privilege and opportunity you have to be in that place right now, right this moment and be experiencing it. So yeah, enjoy. Well, thank you for being an inspiration to so many. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you for being that authentic version of yourself in social media. I think it's so important that we continue to model that to others that... <clears throat> and I think back on my own travels, I, I wish that I had done a better job of that too. And it's something that I work on now right. is to be more open and authentic and share my failures yeah. as much as my successes. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of strength. So yeah. thank you for doing that. And thank, you. and thank you for being such a great ambassador for overlanding and for solo travelers around the world. Um, where do people find out more about you and then maybe share a little bit about What's next on your journey? Mm, yeah, so I am all over social media, but I would say the two main channels are Instagram and YouTube. So weekly videos on YouTube and then just like casual content on Instagram. And uh, the journey is the Pan American Highway. So I am driving it from uh, Mexico to Alaska and Alaska to Ushuaia. Um, so that will be next, I suppose. I'm here in Arizona and the next steps will be crossing Mexico, Central America and on to Argentina eventually. Yeah, you're going to be doing El Camino del Diablo in the next week or so, which is exciting. Yeah, so exciting. Yeah, I yeah. think you'll enjoy that. And then yeah. Mexico is wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's going to be great. I'm well, really looking forward to it. Where well, we're looking forward to following your journeys. I know Ashley Giordano did a little interview with you as mm -hmm. well for Overland Journal, so people can read more about, um, about that conversation. Uh, but thanks again for being on the podcast. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. And we thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>